Well, hi, everybody. I see you all coming in. We still have folks coming in. We're going to give it another minute or two, but I just want to let you know we're here and uh, we're ready to go. So uh, I'm watching you all come in and say hello from, uh, my gosh, all over the place. Uh, lots of friends, lots of people's names like, hey, I know that person. So uh, welcome. We'll get to you. Uh, we'll get going here in just a minute or two. Hi, folks. It's now. I know it's two o'clock right now. We're going to give it just another minute. We still have uh, uh, some folks rolling in. We're going to give them a minute or two, and then, of course, we're going to get going. I also do want to let you know too that this is all being recorded, and it's going to be available to you. I know that a lot of people who we have uh, almost seven hundred people signed up for the webinar, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, we don't expect that all 700 of you will be here live with us today, although that number is ticking up now close to 400. So that's a, that's really great. Uh, but if you are not live uh, here today, welcome. And if you're listening to this later on, uh, we're glad that you signed up. And uh, we'll remind you before we finish today uh, about our upcoming webinars as well. Still rolling in. Um, I'm uh, I'm really thrilled at the response uh, to our webinars and our master classes, and and uh, really so appreciative to all of you for your uh, what you're going through, uh, just in terms of making school happen. And 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 all of you here are so vested and interested in how to incorporate and engage families <clears throat> in this in this situation that we find ourselves in. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, the number is still climbing, but it's slowing down. So I'm going to go ahead and get going and uh, um, um, say officially welcome to you all. I was scrolling through all of the people who had signed up uh, just before the webinar started just to get a sense of where folks were coming from. And it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm going to miss some things. I know I am, and I apologize to you. Uh, if I miss uh, a state or an area, you can yell at me in the chat room. But I see New York and West Virginia, Virginia, Georgia, Texas, Nevada, New Jersey, Rose Acera, my friend from New Jersey. Hey, Rose. Uh, Pasadena, California, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, Nebraska, Iowa, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky. And of course, my friends from North Dakota, Ooh, North Dakota, where they tell me they still have snow. I think I saw some of my friends from Potsdam, New York. Hello, Potsdam, way up north. Of course, all of my Virginia friends, shout out to Spotsylvania County, Virginia Beach, and all of our friends here locally. Uh, friends in McAllen, Texas, and of course, I see some friends from Cobb County, Georgia, and they just keep rolling in. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. So let's get to work. Uh, as usual, I've, I've scheduled uh, three hours of, of information to happen in about an hour. So we're going to have to move. There are so many of you live uh, that you probably will have questions. Um, it's impossible for me to answer those questions in the chat, but there's two options, really three options. One, put your question in the chat and after the webinar, I'll go through and see if I can provide some answers. Two, if you are a Twitter person, put your question in the chat with your Twitter handle and I'll respond to you on Twitter. And by the way, feel free to tweet any of this webinar, uh, anything you want is fine. Or three, uh, I'll give you my email address uh, before this presentation is over and you can email me directly with a question. But I, I don't know that we're gonna have the time or the capacity with now 450 of you uh, uh, to, 
to take questions in the webinar. So I hope you understand and, and uh, I apologize for that. So we really started to talk about this notion of invisible engagement. And many years ago, I coined this phrase uh, as I was still learning about family engagement and still understanding the power of family engagement in the learning lives of children. And what occurred to me uh, was this notion of invisible engagement. And if we could figure out how to make that happen, we could then leverage better learning outcomes for all students. And that really what was what motivated me to do these webinars certainly was the, uh, the crisis, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, of course, that we're in. But I thought now more than ever, these ideas are front and center. Um, I've been tweeting a lot. If you're on Twitter, you've seen me be pretty active lately. And one of the things I've said recently was, you know, if we didn't, I always, I always say, families are the first and most influential teachers of their children. I've been saying that for years. But I tweeted something the other day that said, I've been saying that families are the first and most influential teachers of their children. If you didn't believe that before, you better believe that now because they are clearly front and center uh, in, in determining uh, the learning experiences for students. So let's talk about how we might be able to leverage that and help our kids and our families and you through this very difficult, very, very difficult time. And I said earlier, and I wanna say again, thank you. So many of you are working so incredibly hard and you, you reimagined education uh, literally on a dime overnight. And it's incredible to me, the work that you're doing. So I, I hope you will all stay safe and stay well, and, but we need you and the work you're doing is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, if you want to email me uh, or you want to tweet me, uh, there's all the information. Uh, I'll share a little bit of information later with you about some things on the website for you and where to go to find this and, and other things that we're doing uh, throughout this process. And of course, I, Steve at steveconstantino.com, email me anytime and I'm happy to work with you, help you answer your question or at least point you in the right direction. Our agenda is pretty, pretty clear. We're gonna talk about what invisible engagement is, uh, what is promoting uh, family efficacy and what this might look like for you. Uh, I'm gonna give you some concepts. I'm gonna give you some ideas uh, and I'm gonna share with you uh, kind of a treetop flyover of this so because we don't we don't have a whole lot of time uh, today. Uh, but then you can hopefully take what we talk about today and apply it to the work that you're presently doing. I know we have everybody uh, in, in the audience today, we have everybody from state officials to teachers to uh, family engagement coordinators uh, to paraprofessionals. We have a, just a wide a range of people today. And what we're really talking about are the kinds of experiences that children will now have in learning because that learning is now taking place in their homes. And how can we leverage family engagement in this very strange time that we find ourselves in? We've come up uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a blog and I have been working with a lot of organizations since the beginning of the crisis. And we really have come up with these six ideas in terms of framing this conversation uh, during this period of time uh, that we're dealing with the virus. And uh, I've, given this, I've given this recommendation to individuals, to schools, to districts, even to some states. Uh, and, and, and that are grappling with the continuity of learning through this very difficult time. And I, the six things I think are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them, but I wanted, wanted to share them with you because I think that they serve us well as we try to work our way through uh, this, uh, this period of time. We have to acknowledge the contextual changes in learning. We, have, we don't have classrooms anymore. We don't have bells anymore. We don't have the socialization of kids in schools anymore. School as we knew it is gone. Learning is now completely different in a completely different environment and a completely different experience for students. And so we really need to embrace that. Uh, um, if, if we're trying to do what we did only differently, I'm not so sure that we're going to be as successful as we want to be. Second, I would say reimagine the pace of learning. And that was my way of saying slow down. I'll give you some examples of why I think that's important as we go through the webinar. Um, but what's really important right now, as you can well imagine, is the, the, the health and the emotional well-being of families. And I'm going to make some recommendations to you about putting that first. If you haven't done that already, worry about the learning uh, later. Learning will come. 
account for the emotional strain of learning at home. Um, I'll give you, you know, you've all seen, I think one of the funniest things I saw on Twitter was uh, the parent who on the first day of in-home learning suspended both of her children. I thought that was hilarious. Um, so she, it, it took one day for her to have a newfound appreciation for teaching. Uh, but we have lots of parents who are struggling, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Consider your role if you're a teacher, uh, uh, um, a paraprofessional, or you are somehow a guidance counselor, or you're somehow providing, you've always provided um, support and learning opportunities to kids in schools. Consider your role shifting to coach. You're now coaching somebody to do what you would normally do. Um, and we'll talk about that in terms of leveraging the efficacy of families. And then lastly, the landscape. The landscape has changed. I've heard a couple of people talk about, well, when we go back to normal, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, usually at the end of, uh, after every major crisis uh, that the world sees, 9-11 and things like that, we go back to some semblance of normal, but there'll always be some different things. And I think we need to already begin to think about what that's going to look like. We're gonna learn a lot in this period. You know, This has thrown us a curveball for sure. And this has really put us into a lot of mayhem. But I think once we come out of the tailspin, I think that there's a lot we can learn, especially about authentic learning, about family engagement, and about what really matters uh, with regard to learning. So six ideas for you to consider as we move through the webinar today. Prior to COVID-19, um, I and as you know, I. I travel the world working with folks on family engagement. And I'm often asked to look at the family engagement plans that schools or districts have created. And more often than not, they look a little bit like this, uh, that you are creating opportunities for parents to attend things. And if, if you've been in my workshops, you've heard me talk about this before, math night, reading night, this night, that night, back to school night, financial aid night, everything you need to know about state testing night. We spend a lot of time um, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, 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 having things for people to come to, and we look to increase their attendance uh, to, to those events. That has been a mainstay of a lot of family engagement plans uh, since, um, since the beginning of um, time, really. Now, all of a sudden, uh, it doesn't work. We don't have any events anymore. We don't have um, uh, uh, anywhere for people to go. People can't gather. So we are doing what we naturally think is correct. And uh, I want to applaud you for all that you are doing because it is incredibly important. I'm gonna make some suggestions and recommendations today about some things that we've already learned uh, and some things that we can apply to what you're already doing. Remember, family engagement is never about doing more. It's always about doing what we already do, only only differently. This is right, uh, these next couple of slides are really things that I just picked right out of the news and right out of, of, uh, of the um, social media. Uh, this is out of the Washington Post. There, you're seeing a lot of stories and a lot of news and a lot of, uh, uh, articles being written now about what's happening with education, what's happening with learning. People are speculating what will happen next year, what will happen when students are able to return to school. Are they going to be in the same grade? Will they advance? Will there be grades? Se millions of seniors, of course, are probably devastated at the fact that school is over, their graduations have been disrupted. There's a lot of angst. Uh, out there, as you can well imagine. And I'm sure there's a lot of angst in your school as you are scrambling and working tirelessly, not only to deal, um, to help your students in your classrooms, but all of you have your own families uh, and your own pressures and things to do. So we, we understand that. And we're seeing that being reflected in the news that we see. This was a tweet. I took out any identifying, even though it's public and it doesn't really matter. I didn't feel it was appropriate. Um, but this was a tweet uh, from a parent. I don't know who she, she was, uh, but what interested me was the number of retweets and likes it got very, very quickly. And this kind of stress is coming out. It's coming out in the news. It's coming out on social media. Uh, it's, it's coming out in correspondences. And I think 
one of my uh, pieces of advice is is to try to not re overly react or react to the stress. I think we're all going to move through stress differently, and 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 we just have to be patient with each other. Uh, we have to be kind to each other, and I and I I really do believe that if we can get that right, uh, we can then continue down the avenue of student learning. If um, much of the work that all of the work that I do is based on the work that my collective research, collective body of work called the Five Simple Principles. And if you have been in one of our workshops or have seen me work, you probably have seen this diagram, the logic model, uh, the five components to the process of family engagement. Today is the first time, actually yesterday, we had a small group in our master class. But in terms of our webinar, you are the first group of people who are going to get a sneak peek um, at the new model, because in September, the second edition of Engage Every Family will be published by Corwin, and I'm very appreciative uh, of their interest in continuing to promote family engagement. And we've learned some things uh, since we first published the book and we first started collecting data from schools around the country. And so we've made some modifications to the model. You'll see uh, that the biggest change, really, in addition to the color, <laughs> uh, is to, to remove the word empower and to add the word efficacy in principle number three. Uh, empowering, the word empower was sometimes misunderstood. Um, efficacy means to empower, but we've gone ahead and said, look, if we really want to get learning to improve, we have to build and then leverage the efficacy of families. So we've made some contextual changes uh, in the model. And then in the book, you'll see some changes where we've added sections, of course, uh, longer discussions of equity and uh, a new chapter based on the responses we get from around the country, a new chapter that's focused on secondary school family engagement. Uh, one of the top questions I get everywhere that I go. So today, what we're really talking about is this. How can we leverage the efficacy? What is efficacy and how do we leverage it when we don't see anybody, when we can't be with anybody, when the, the best we can do perhaps is maybe uh, working between uh, here, be, you know, over Zoom, something like that, or over the web or through email. So let's talk about that a little bit. Efficacy is the power to produce an effect. Self-efficacy, I think most of us understand that we all have some level of self-efficacy, meaning that we believe that we can get something done. However, what we have to remember, it's human nature for people to think about the potential outcome before they get engaged with something. So if we want families to be engaged with their child's learning, but they don't see that their engagement will produce a better outcome, we then have a bit more of an uphill climb to engage families in, in their children's education. Um, the same holds true for ourselves. If there's something that we, we really want to accomplish in our life, but we don't see that we don't see our own ability to be able to do it, chances are we won't make the goal that we've set for ourselves. Look at that last bullet on this sheet because it becomes an important point. They must believe that their skills and abilities are suitable to making it happen. Now think about the continuum of families that you serve in your school district. I would imagine, you know, if we were to just take a slice of the United States and just pull out any school district, whether uh, urban, suburban, rural, large, small, in between, pretty much every school district is going to have a continuum of families and students. Um, you're going to have different cultures and different languages, and there's going to be different socioeconomic levels, and there's going to be different neighborhoods and different values and different cultures. And how then do we create an arena in which we can get all of those different kinds of families to believe that they have a role in their children's learning? What they're, what's scaring a lot of families now is that they're front and center. They feel this pressure like, oh my gosh, if I don't do this well, my child is not going to be successful. Remember, one of the things we also know from research uh, is that every family, there's one commonality amongst every family, and that is that they want their children to exceed them in their quality of life. This is really scaring families because they feel as though that without you, without your professionalism, uh, their children are going to backslide. And so they're panicking. 
There's a lot of panic out there. One of the things that you can do is do everything in your power to try to reduce that that panic. I saw a note earlier. I want to apologize to all of the school counselors out there. I, my age is showing. Forgive me for that. Um, take a look at what I highlighted in red for you. What we're going to try to do in the next 40 minutes or so uh, is to improve and support efficacy of families. And we're going to try to embed that in whatever it is you're doing now to provide learning opportunities for students in homes. It would take us three hours to talk about all of the different ways that I've already heard that schools are responding to the crisis. There are issues of technology and there's issues of equity and there are issues of language barriers and there's a lot of issues that schools are working through. Uh, there are special education issues that seem on that seem extremely daunting at the moment in terms of how to work our way through all of those things. But that's exactly what we're doing. We're working our way through it. I don't I don't suggest and don't even think for a moment that this is a panacea that what we're talking about today is going to cure everything that ails us but i think it can move us a little bit closer to whatever desire we have for learning that happens between now and whenever students are able to return to school so what is invisible engagement we've known for a long time in research that the best kind of family engagement is family engagement that we never saw um, it was less about coming to math night and more about how the parent's efficacy was supporting a student's learning at home. Most of the efficacy work that we see that is we can draw straight lines to learning usually happens in places that we don't see. For example, <clears throat> if I were to say, you know, if my elementary friends who are listening today uh, how many of you uh, before schools closed down were wanting to or perhaps have had a math night or a reading night, some kind of a night in which you wanted to share academically with families? Most of my friends are have been involved in something like that. And I usually ask the question, and, and that is, did anything improve as a result of math night? Did kids get better in math as a result of it? They were supposed to. That was the idea. But Sometimes when we do events at schools, you've heard me talk about engaging the already engaged. So what we're trying to do now is say, look, we have no events. This, this is not about events. Family engagement is a process, not an event or a series of events. So now we want to promote this invisible idea. And what the, what the pandemic has done has basically put it front and center. It's the only kind of learning we have now. It's no longer an option. Um, I've, I've said for a couple of weeks now, you know, after almost 26 years of working in family engagement, I'm finally at the point to say, I never thought it, I never thought it was an option. Now I know it's not an option. Uh, we really do need to engage our families in the education of children. So let's get to some suggestions. <clears throat> As I said earlier, I think the social emotional needs of families and the trauma that we're all facing as a result of this has to be front and center. And that's where I think all of us, and I think counselors and teachers and educators are particularly good at supporting the emotional needs of children. Uh, I, and, and I really do inspire you to think about how you can take those skills that you have and extend it to families. If you don't have a trusting relationship with a family, if you've had a, a, a relationship with a family that has been less than perhaps positive, I'm going to challenge you to try to let that go. I know that there have been difficulties in the past and I know that perhaps there are things that have been said between families and teachers and feelings that have been hurt. But now is a time where we have to find a way to come together and it's especially true for those families who were disengaged with us before the virus, because now they're disengaged, but they're central to the learning life of their child. So we have to find a way to connect them, acknowledge their stress, as I said, acknowledge what's happening, but start asking them questions. Um, ask them what obstacles exist. You know, we've heard stories of three or four kids in a household, one computer, poor internet access, no computers, no access to internet, um, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of different scenarios. 
we need to learn that in order to create learning that's going to be meaningful and relevant so that we can engage students and engage families. Try to talk to them about their routines and activities. What have they established? We've all now established a, uh, a routine. Uh, uh, as strange as it is, we now have these new routines. And um, again, I would emphasize to reduce the pace of learning um, you know, you saw that tweet earlier, and, and I think that whoever the teacher was, was absolutely well intended because the student must have these learning experiences. Uh, we just have to recognize that it's probably not going to work that way. And if we can just slow down a little bit and look at what's really important and then engage families with what's really important, I think in the end, um, we can get a lot more accomplished. Many states, and I don't know, I don't know the number, but I know that many states have applied for a waiver to the United States Department of Education uh, to um, basically forego any kind of state testing for the end of the school year, which has taken a lot of pressure off and changed the dynamics of learning. And I also now, there's lots of conversations going on across the country about the role of grading and grades from the time of the virus until the end of the school year and what should we do and how should we do it. And I know that many states are working on guidance documents and continuity documents to help schools make these decisions uh, that we never two months ago, three months ago, who knew uh, that we would be faced. So here, uh, in order to engage families, step one is to determine the feasibility of it. If a, if a child's family happens to be healthcare workers, right now the chances of them being engaged are gonna be pretty slim and rightfully so. So we need to know, we need to figure out what's going on out there. So my first piece of advice is to spend time learning that. Put student learning aside for a moment and just talk about some of these things. When we design learning that doesn't happen in front of us, and when we're trying to design learning um, that engages families and that promotes this notion of invisible engagement, we're really talking about constructivism. We all need to go back into our coursework and remember the different philosophies and the different ideas of education. Constructivism was one of them. And what I've done for you is just given you a few quick bullets on the notion of what constructivism is and because this, in my opinion, lends itself best to creating learning opportunities for students um, while they are uh, at home learning as opposed to school. So we want them to be part of the learning. We want parents and families to be part of the learning. We want it to be active learning. Uh, and it's always, it's gonna be personal from home to home and neighborhood to neighborhood and school to school. So if you can dust off some of your old work um, uh, in construct constructivist activities in learning, I think those are the ones that serve you best when we're trying to figure out how to, con how to, to continue learning at home. Let's continue on a little bit more with invisible engagement. <clears throat> Engaging families in learning design. Much of what I'm reading and much of the correspondence that I have been getting in the last few weeks, uh, folks have been telling me, Steve, we're sending, we're sending stuff home, we're emailing, we're texting, we're using a, a wide variety of social media, we're communicating with families, we're giving them resources. All of that is great. Now what I would like you to think about is, can they be involved in the design of the use of those things? Can we co-construct learning with families? Is that possible? Well, it's always been possible. Um, and can we take what we're already doing and redesign it in this, pro in, this, in this way? Consider whoever the adult caregiver is in the home as your co-teacher. Um, they are equal to you now in terms of providing a learning experience for children. Uh, they just don't have your level of expertise. So we need you very much to help them. You know, we, we, we can't teach them how to become you, but we can help them help their children to provide some level of normalcy 
uh, in learning. I'd like to avoid those two areas uh, that tend to um, stunt engagement. And that's the two areas uh, I talk about this in workshops all the time. And that is, <clears throat> we generally think when we think about often when we think about family engagement, we think about information. I have to get information to families. We want to get and sometimes we probably overload families with information, but it's all with the very best intentions because we don't want to, we don't want anyone to not know something that's really important. But when we inform somebody, that's one way communication where I have a piece of information and I'm sharing it with you. Um, the other kind of, of, of engagement that I'd like to try to avoid through this period and hopefully afterward is what I call compliance engagement, meaning here's what you need to do in order for your child to be successful. Your child has these problems and they need to turn them in by tomorrow. You need to sign the agenda. You need to sign that you need to email me back and let me know. It's always about things that families need to do. Uh, so I call that a compliance engagement. I would like to try to avoid those two things as being the sole reason to engage families. Still important to inform people, absolutely. And it's still important to, to help parents understand what is expected of their children. But let's go back to that first bullet. Can we engage them in the design? In, and can, can they help us demonstrate learning? I'll give you a, another idea before we're done here today about how you might be able to get that done. Um, and then tie your learning experience to what you've learned about families. Uh, there's so much creative, uh, there's so much creative uh, learning going on right now. Uh, it's hard for me as an individual just to keep up with it, you know, in terms of what I'm seeing on social media, what I'm reading on, 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 the, on the web and, and what, what folks are telling me, and then just what I know that's happening, you know, in an in a area near to me. Um, incredible work is going on with journaling and, and getting kids to express their feelings. Um, think about think about that kind of work. I think that starts to move us into the constructivist avenue. Think about how we can tie that to family experiences. Um, if we find out, if you were to have a conversation with a family and you found out, for example, that um, dad is a chef or mom is a baker, uh, is there something you could help them with uh, in terms of their knowledge and how their knowledge might apply to the learning that's important to their child on that particular day or in that particular week? So that's what that means. That means trying to tie families' real experiences and what's, what they're experiencing to what learning is happening in the home at the moment. So one of the one of the recommendations that uh, that we have made, and actually yesterday I finally got, I got some initial feedback, and and that this worked really well, is to once again put student learning aside uh, for a day or two. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy, and I know that many of us are saying, you know, we've lost time already. We've lost instructional time. We've lost a lot, uh, and I think that I, I don't. Per, this is a personal opinion. You don't have to agree with me. I don't know that we should spend our time trying to chase what we've lost. I think we should probably spend our time trying to structure what we have. And one of the things I had recommended was to promote um, family conversations uh, where students, you know, are given the day off or the night off or an hour off saying this is just for mom and dad or whoever the adult caregiver is in the home. And, and ask them, you can see the questions here. I'm not going to read the slides to you. We're going to make all of this available to you. Uh, but ask them about what they're experiencing. Find out if they're experiencing any of the illness in their home or within their family or in their neighborhood. As this thing rolls on, the more and more the answer to that question is going to be yes. Uh, and that, that in itself uh, uh, is traumatic for families. We need to know if they've lost wages. We need to know if they're critical employees who are now working incredible hours like you are uh, to um, help the sick and help the needy. These are all pieces of information that you as educators have to know in order to make learning relevant because what will happen is that the tyranny of the urgent as Stephen Covey used to say, will crowd out what's important. And right now, um, 
what's urgent, it really is tyranny. Uh, this virus is wreaking havoc around the world. And as you can see, almost everything is taking a back seat to it. Uh, and there's, and so we want to make sure that learning now continues. It just looks a little bit differently. And most importantly, get their feedback. Two-way communication means feedback. Um, if you've read any of Dr. Hattie's work in visible learning, you know the importance of feedback. We all know uh, the critical nature of feedback. Classroom teachers, teachers wanting feedback from their uh, their colleagues and their instructional coaches. We all we all thrive on feedback. We all get better on feedback. We need to get their feedback. We need to know what's working for them and what's not working for them. Uh, there was a story the other day of a teacher who sent a pa allegedly, I don't know if this is true, uh, allegedly sent home 25 math problems and, and, and they got there at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And the note on the email was that all of these problems had to be done and submitted to the teacher no later than 3 p.m. And I get it. I understand that why that teacher did that. And I am absolutely not, um, not pointing the finger, but we have to understand that nine to three doesn't exist anymore. Um, we already are seeing studies of most kids now going to bed after midnight. More children than usual are staying up later. Days are not uh, normal anymore. And so can we adapt what we're doing? Lots of you are already uh, doing some of these things already, but that's how we can begin to promote that invisible engagement. So I would suggest, I also have suggested, um, you know, web-based conferencing. I, I don't mean conference in the traditional sense of a parent-teacher conference, but just a way to check in with individual families. So many teachers I read about are checking in with individual students. Um, they're calling uh, every day. Don't forget mom and dad. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, if get a chance to, to hear them out. I'm, I'm sure that they would love an ear. I know that uh, your time is precious as well, but a couple of minutes talking to a family, especially one that had been disenfranchised from the school before the pandemic, I think will go a long way to helping us through it and give us a better situation on the other side. Let's continue with the specifics. Um, design things that can happen in the home. And I understand that, you know, doing things that you send home and then sending back are designed for in-home learning. But think back to the constructivism that I talked about. Think back to the idea of co-constructing learning with families, because that's where, their, that's where their influence begins to surface. That's where their efficacy begins to flower. That's where their role takes on more meaning and that's and uh, our our third webinar in two weeks is going to be about family academic socialization. Whew, big set of words, but really what that means is the more that we can socialize families, uh, the more they socialize their own children. So it's to our advantage to try to do some of these things that you see listed uh, on this <clears throat> on this page. We want families to be more than just monitors of learning. Uh, let's let's get them engaged. You can give them questions and answers. You know, you can say, "Hey, um, uh, your son." This I'm going to make this up off the top of my head, but you know, your your child was asked to read two paragraphs and write two sentences about the main idea. Um, <clears throat> your child should write something like this. Uh, so ask them what they wrote and let me know as the teacher, you know, send me a text or send or give me a call or an email. Let me know what they, what they came up with. Uh, that kind of interaction, now that, that empowers a parent. A uh, parent can say, you know, what did you think the main idea is of the two parents? They don't have to know what a main idea is. They don't have to know what the paragraph said. This is not about teaching families. It's just about giving them a role. It's about connecting them somehow to the learning that's happening at home. And that's a dividend, not on the first day, but I think families will appreciate uh, a little bit of a slower pace and a little bit more engagement. Um, and then of course, again, 
not to sound like a broken record, but to invite their feedback. Hey, that really worked well, or my gosh, we didn't do well at all. Or, you know, my son sat at the kitchen table and cried for a half an hour because he didn't know what he was supposed to do. Those are the kinds of things that you can't see anymore. Um, and we want to know that before it builds up in frustration and you get some sort of an angry email. Um, I used to, you know, I, I can remember getting it from time to time in my education career, getting a, an email that was in all cap, all capitals. I used to call that e-yelling. I knew that person wasn't happy with me. So let's not let it get to that point. But uh, remember that what's happening inside of families' minds is that they want their children to exceed them in their quality of life. They find themselves in a situation that no one could have predicted. And, and perhaps if their child is struggling, that really is pushing their emotion and it's gonna come out somehow. Let's give it an avenue before it blows. Let's get their feedback. I can't emphasize enough to you that that alone, if we just did that, I think we could immediately improve a lot of conditions for you and for families and most importantly for students around the country. Debbie Pushor is a, a, a colleague of mine uh, in Canada, a researcher, a professor, author, thinker, a thought leader in family engagement. And she wrote something the other day uh, that I thought was really interesting because it really kind of encapsulated in a sentence what I have been trying to talk about now for about 40 minutes. Um, you have the rich opportunity to make visible for parents of all of the curriculum outcomes they are naturally realizing as they cook with their kids, read, tell stories, build things, and discuss news. Yesterday, I got a question um, from someone about a school district where their the primary language was not English, that the majority of people who sent their children to school were other languages, and it was more than one. There were several. And the schools always had had a difficult time in communicating with families. Now it seemed impossible. My solution, my recommendation was to work through the religious organizations in your community um, to see if pastors and reverends and, and rabbis and, and preachers and people who are involved in religion could be of some assistance to us to use that community resource in how they're communicating with families as well. It's possible that a family will express uh, um, uh, their emotions to a minister, uh, and it's if we have a right, if we have a relationship, if we have a partnership, perhaps we can be part of that solution as well. So I just thought that this was an interesting idea that that Debbie shared, and and really what it is 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 that we're trying to change. Remember that first point way back at the beginning of the webinar understand that the context of learning has changed. This one statement talks about the change in the context of learning. And so what happens is, is that how we continue to produce learning, because we are the ones who are gonna do that, how can we do it in this new environment, in this new, and, and it's not gonna be a week or a month. We don't know how long this is going to be. We hope to be back in school in the fall. We don't know that. Uh, we don't really know anything. We know that we're in the throes of this thing right now. And so we need to begin to think about how we can reimagine our relationships with families, how we can reimagine what we're asking students to do at home. Remember, not more, just different. I, I am not adding anything to your plate. That's not my intention. My intention is just to think and do things a little bit differently than perhaps some of us are doing them. We've been collecting uh, information from families, as you can imagine, uh, about their experiences thus far. And this is just the opening weeks. Uh, what was really interesting to me was that after the, you know, that first week of in-home learning for most of the country was actually far more positive than anybody, anybody imagined it would be. Um, teach, wonderful, there's wonderful stories of what teachers were doing across the country. You know, so many of the communities had the teachers driving in cars and saying hello to kids. and the kids out on the street and everybody's crying because they miss their teacher and pictures of teachers crying because they miss their kids. Uh, really a very emotional thing, but it was really generally positive. What happened was we got to the second week and more of reality was setting in that we were in this for the long haul and that maybe what we were doing during that first week, we couldn't sustain for three months. 
or we couldn't sustain into the fall if God forbid we have to do that. So what we're trying to do now is collect some ideas from families. And on the left-hand side, of course, you see the things that families have told us they really like, things that are really making them feel better, things that are empowering them, things that are promoting their efficacy. Look at that first list, one, two, three, four, five. You're communicating my role to me as a parent. You're telling me that I have a glove in this game, that I'm really important to the learning outcomes of my child. I'm not a teacher. I'm not you. And I, I can't be you. And many parents now are saying, I don't, I don't want to be you. But I don't want I want my child to to be as as safe and as nurtured as possible through a very difficult time. Parents are loving the relationship building. They're loving when teachers are just talking about life and not worried about, about um, learning or what's gonna happen or what time things need to be turned in. It's just checking in to see if people are okay and families checking in with their children's teachers to see if their children's teachers are okay as well. So you'll see down the left-hand side, things that families are really attracted to and are really appreciating. I've got some more things later uh, in the presentation to share with you that we've already collected uh, in terms of things that are happening around the country from uh, the school perspective. Look at the right-hand side of the, of the screen now. These are things that parents have told us are not working well. Um, it is very natural for us as educators to say, look, I, I, I'm." until somebody tells me what else I'm supposed to do, this is what I'm supposed to do. I get it. Uh, we are all flying blind. This isn't even building the plane while flying it. I mean, I, I don't even know we ever, we got into the air without a plane and now we're building one. Um, so it's a very, very difficult, very, very difficult situation. What's going to, what's going to upset, not upset in terms of mad, but what's going to be of concern to families is if we say to things like we, you know, that we give the impression that we're not sure that we're doing the right thing, or we're not, even if we're not, <laughs> which we, which is probably the truth, um, probably better left unsaid. I don't know that we should have classes during the day. Um, I think parents are really struggling with an hour of this, an hour of that, brain breaks, color coded. I've, there's all kinds of things happening where teachers, and again, with the very best intentions, have color coded a schedule for the day for a family. Um, that's not going to work for everybody. And so I think we, we go back to those ideas of flexibility and constructivism to see how learning might look from that vantage point. Inconsistent communication or a lack of communication. Um, I, I'm finding it hard to believe that that's an issue because I think right now there's so much communication going on. But remember that we want to receive communication as much as we deliver communication. We have to provide a way for feedback. We have to provide a way for two-way communication. And, and to the degree possible, as I said earlier in the webinar, and I know this is very difficult, to understand that emotions are gonna come out of people that will come out after us or it may seem very demonstrative toward us. Um, one of the tips that I always give in workshops is I tell my friends to always remember that anger is always a mask for fear. And so if parents do become frustrated and they do become angry and the chances are they already have or they will, please understand that what's driving that is the fundamental fear if we can find the fear. So if we can work through the anger, don't be fearful of feedback because we're afraid that it's going to be negative. Chances are some of it's going to be negative. It's okay. Um, we are learning through this process and we can appreciate that feedback. And then if, if it's valuable to us, incorporate that feedback uh, into what we do next. So this lack of continuity uh, one of my neighbors, as a matter of fact, said to me the other day that she, her words, not my words, she had been bombarded with texts. Uh, she has a middle school student. And I don't know how many teachers the middle school student sees per day, but each one of those teachers were, were texting a lot of information to families. And, and um, uh, the, the, the parent said, she said, she said, they're not able to talk to each other. She said, I don't think they realize that they're all doing the same thing at one time. And I said to her, I said, well, I'm, I'm sure that they do. 
uh, I think the teachers are doing, teachers are still working together, school faculties are still meeting together uh, virtually, principals are still helping teachers. I, I, so I reassured her that we were talking to each other, but her point was still, can we somehow coordinate, somehow look at the continuity of the, of the amount of information that comes home? And is it really, really necessary for everybody to do it? So is there a system that we can put into place that doesn't overwhelm um, families around the country or families in your school district? And then interestingly enough, we're hearing now as we, as we talk with families around the country, um, assumptions that families cannot help. In one case, and, and, and I'm, I'm sad to say, in one case, um, somebody from a school said to a family, your child will need to do this work because you won't be able to. And um, I, again, I, I wanna be very understanding of, of what we're doing and, and we're kind of making this up as we go along, but let's never ever assume that a family, uh, any family can help. Every family has efficacy. Every family has more influence over their children than we ever did and they look different and they act different and they know different things and they have different skills and they have different knowledge, but let's not assume that they can't um, assist uh, in the manner that I'm describing to you throughout this, throughout this webinar, because they very much, they very much can do that. <clears throat> Here's some things that we've already heard from some of our friends around the country. As a matter of fact, this may be reflective of some of the people on the webinar today. Um, these are real things that are happening. I actually, I think from all of them, I'm looking at it because I did it very quickly this morning, as a matter of fact, I think uh, you'll see that these are G Georgia, Virginia, and Texas are the three places that these ideas come from. Um, these ideas were directly correlated to what families were appreciating that was happening in school. And, and again, I, I'm not a slide reader, but take a look, take a second and just take a look at what some of our friends are already doing uh, around the country. Um, the third bullet in the first column, I believe that we have observed now what should have happened before. Teachers communicating and engaging families into learning. So we've, they've refocused and reorganized their tools for that purpose. Um, one of the schools are trying, the family engagement personnel in the district are trying to send tips and ideas and trying to do some sort of, of my words, kind of down and dirty professional development uh, on, on tips for engaging families uh, during this crisis. And then if you'll see the second bullet on the right-hand side in blue, we are meeting the family where they are. We are planning with the family, not for the family. We are focusing on their strengths, setting mutually acceptable goals, and providing services that are meaningful and beneficial to them. I could not have said that better myself. And I think that that one statement really encapsulates my message to you this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. We know we have, we have people from uh, Australia to Alaska to the East Coast. So good morning, good afternoon, good day. Um, but that really is the central issue. Work with them. Um, and and not do things for them, not make assumptions for them, because I think we will we will um, ultimately kind of end up back where we started. And I'm not so sure that that we need to we need to have that happen. But you can take a look at these. Once again, I want to remind you that um, uh, we will make this presentation available. You'll all get a, a, an email as to where it's going to be. You're going to be able to go back and look at it again and, and, and pull out of it what you want. You can sit on your telephone and take pictures of all of this. If, if it, it's all yours. So do whatever you wish with it. Um, so here are some real stories from the field so far, just a couple of weeks into this, uh, into this crisis. I wanted to end today with an assignment. Um, this is a real assignment. This, this really happened, and I've blocked out everything that I believe identifies uh, anything about this. Um, but this came home uh, uh, and um, was delivered and, and said, you know, have your child do this and send it back. So let's take a look at it for a moment. 
We as educators, uh, I think, immediately know what this is, but more importantly, why it's important. Why, it's, why is it important for a child to know the main idea? We know that. Uh, we want our kids to know that. There's basically a good chance that our families might not understand that. So a dutiful family is going to say, okay, you've got to find the main idea. And looks like you got to find the main idea and color that in yellow and color the rest of the details in green. And so you'll see what you see what the child did as a result of the the experience uh, that they that they got. This parent, however, put this on Twitter, and the parent then said this. When a Pulitzer Prize winning person puts something out on social media, a lot of people read it. Uh, and uh, I'm using this kind of as a final example to talk about how could we have done this differently, given what we've talked about in the last now 55 minutes? Was, was there a better way to teach the important concept of a main idea in this in-home learning environment that we find ourselves in. You are experts in your field. You, you know your content and what you are to do. You know the standards of what you are to teach. If you're a building leader or a district leader, you understand the strategic goals that you have set uh, for your school and for your district. If you're a paraprofessional or you are a school counselor or you are a family engagement staff member, uh, you all play a role. I will, I will say uh, in just a few minutes that we have left, um, family, if you are a Title I uh, school or school district and you do have family engagement personnel, parent involvement specialists, those are the people that need to be at the center of this. They can help you uh, with the design and the reimagine, and, and they understand the, the family dynamics, work with them, include them in the process of what's happening in your schools as well. I think you, you have a, if you have family engagement personnel available to you, I think that's a tremendous resource for you that you, you should be able, um, you should tap into. Uh, we've had a lot of family engagement folks write to me and we had a lot on our master class and we have a lot of them uh, in the webinars and the things that we're doing now. So again, this lesson is just a way to get you to think differently. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what the main idea is. Um, and, and if you go on, the backstory to this is that there's a, a discussion that occurs about what the main idea really is. There's a difference of opinion as to the main idea and it all gets crazy. Well, we, there, if we took those ideas of invisible engagement, if we took the ideas of constructivism, if we took the ideas of the importance of feedback, could we have delivered the very important main idea lesson in a different way that would have been more successful than unfortunately this lesson was? That's really why I, I leave you with that question because I know you, uh, literally many of you I know, and I know you're really smart, energetic, enthusiastic, innovative people. And all I need to do hopefully is plant a seed in your mind about the fact that this is really not about more. It's, it's just about doing things a little bit differently. So I want to draw your attention to um, you will see uh, an offer, uh, an offer button. If you'd like to learn, we, um, I, like every other organization in the United States, have have been now making all of our work available online. Uh, these webinars that we're doing for free and all of this work that we're doing now is to do something quick and to be as helpful as we possibly can. Time will tell if we're, you know, if we find that we're not helping, then we certainly are not going to take your time. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, you know, feel free to go to our website and poke around a little bit. If you haven't signed up for next week's webinar, which will happen next Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock, please do. 
Um, next week, we're going to take some of these ideas that we talked about and talk about the role of technology. Uh, we can't, we're not going to talk about the problems associated with equity, but we are going to talk about making the best use of the technology that we have. And the presentation is not about a specific piece of technology. As a matter of fact, it's, it's technology agnostic. It really is, you have these tools, is there a way that we can use them to leverage the efficacy that we just talked about? And so we're gonna actually go through that and give you some examples of what that might look like as well. So I really do wanna thank you for attending today. I promise if you have put questions in the chat room, I, I will do my very best, give me a little bit of time and I will get to those questions. If you gave me your Twitter handle, great. Um, I will tweet out an answer as soon as I can. If you wanna email me um, a longer question, if I, and, and even if we wanna jump on a call, I'm happy to help you. Um, you know, my life is always from airport to schools and, and right now I'm home and, and I am happy to, to do everything in my power to assist you uh, in this very, very difficult time. Last thing I wanna say again is where I started, thank you. Thank you and God bless you for the work that you do. Uh, it is so critical and so important. And, and we need to keep our chins up and we need to understand that what we're doing is incredibly important, world saving. Uh, and uh, I'm just privileged to have a one hour to try to help in that cause. So thank you everybody, um, stay well, stay safe. And we hope to see you in a future webinar. If not, uh, I can't. I look forward to getting back out on the road and seeing all my friends across the country. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.